video is going to talk about the types of sources that you might encounter as you do research. And you will encounter these sources whether you're doing research online with Google or whether you're doing them in a database. Um, but it's really important to understand what types of sources you need to find and what you're actually looking at so that you can select appropriately. So there are three basic types of sources, primary, secondary, and tertiary, or sometimes that's called reference sources. So primary sources are going to be um, original materials on which other research is based. They're often from the time period involved and they haven't been filtered through any interpretation or evaluation, so they're really raw data. This might include things like literary or artistic works. If you read a short story for class, that is a primary source. Um, Interviews are another great example of primary sources. You might be asked to do interviews or read a transcript of interviews. Any sort of artifact, whether it's a movie or a recording of a conversation um, or meeting or film or an art artifact, all of that, it hasn't been interpreted, it just exists as it is, is a primary source. Raw data is a primary source. So survey results before they've been um, discussed, analyzed, or interpreted are all raw data. And then finally, historical accounts that are from the time period. So if you are looking at, for instance, a newspaper article from September 11th, that is actually a primary source because it's showing um, the immediate, unfiltered, uncommented upon information. Now, our next type of source is secondary sources. Secondary sources are accounts written after the fact with the benefit of hindsight. They are interpretations and they include evaluations of primary sources, but they can also be interpretations and evaluations of other secondary sources. Um, the key feature to a secondary source is that it comments on and discusses evidence. So secondary sources can include bibliographies. They can include magazine or journal articles. Some textbooks are secondary sources and also scholarly books or monographs. Um, these are books that make like academic arguments about sources. Finally, tertiary or reference sources. You've probably heard of this called references. Um, these are distillations or collections of primary and secondary sources. They tend to be a collection of the agreed upon facts. So when there's wide agreement about something and there's not a lot of difference of opinion about certain parts of the conversation that are factual, um, that's called a tertiary or a reference source. They can include dictionaries, encyclopedias, almanacs, manuals, and most lower level textbooks where there's not a lot of disagreement about the basic features of a discipline, idea, or um, situation. Now, in addition to the levels of sources, primary, secondary, and tertiary, we have to think about how they're published and where they're published. So they're popular sources or scholarly sources. Popular sources are going to be those sources produced for a general audience. Popular sources are usually written by journalists who are paid to go out and find information, um, write the information, get it edited and published. They are usually non-technical and the editing is going to be done by an editor of a publication. So if you read a newspaper article in the Washington Post that's written by a journalist for a general audience, um, and it's edited and fact-checked by a publisher. If you read an article in The Atlantic, it's written by a journalist for a general audience. The language is usually non-technical. The timeline for popular press publications is daily, weekly, or monthly. Newspapers are usually daily. Magazines can be weekly or monthly. Um, and then there's some like trade publications that are just monthly publications. You can usually find these on a newsstand. If you walk into your supermarket, those are all popular press publications. If you go into Barnes and Noble and you look at their newsstand on the side wall there, those are all popular press um, sources and they're good for interviews, statistics, and quick facts. 
Now, peer-reviewed or scholarly sources are a little bit different. You're not going to run into these at your local grocery store. You're not going to find them at your local Barnes & Noble. You're going to have to go to a library, and usually you're going to have to use a paid subscription through a database because these are written by scientists and other experts. Um, these are professional academics who do research and publish it as part of their job. Their audience is not general. You are not the audience for these. Um, Peer-reviewed scholarly sources are written for other people in the field. So a scientist is writing for other scientists. A literary theorist is writing for other literary theorists. A psychiatrist is writing for other psychiatrists. The language in these is highly technical. And it's technical not because they're purposely trying to be obtuse, but because they're um, writing to an audience who would understand that, uh, that particular type of wording. So when a scientist is using highly specific and technical statistical terms, they're doing that because they know other people in their audience already understand those terms. The big difference between a peer-reviewed source and a popular source is that peer-reviewed sources go through something called the peer review process. And we're gonna talk about that in just a second. Another big difference is in how long it takes for these things to get published, whereas popular press sources are at most monthly, most peer-reviewed or scholarly sources are only coming out once, maybe twice a year. And they include original studies, theoretical research, and research of other scholarly work. Now, one of the biggest differences between popular and scholarly sources is why they are published. Popular press sources are published for profit. They are published usually by a for-profit newspaper, magazine, or other media company. Peer-reviewed sources are always published by a non-profit source. Their interest is not in making money. They don't have any ads on their pages. They're usually pretty boring and plain when you look at the layout of the journals. Um, the goal for these is for experts in the field to share information. They're not interested in appealing to or entertaining a general audience. So they're going to be very, very different. So like I said, one of the biggest differences in these sources is the peer review process. So if you're a journalist working for Time Magazine, you get hired by Time Magazine. They give you an assignment or you pitch an assignment to them. Um, your editor says yes or no. You write it. It gets checked and it gets published. When you're doing writing for a peer-reviewed source or a scholarly source, it's a little bit different. An author will decide that they want to go research something. They'll come up with a question. They'll do um, original research to find original information to add to the conversation. And then once they do that, they will actually um, go in and write the article and send it off to the journal of their choice. From that point, the editor will assess it and the editor will make a call. They'll either say, nope, this isn't even close and they'll reject it or they'll send it to reviewers. Now, when it says peer review, it's a lot like when you peer review workshop your fellow classmates papers. In this case, what's going to happen is the author's name is going to be taken off the um, off of the article. It's going to be a blind review. So the reviewers have no idea who wrote it, whether it's somebody famous or whether it's a brand new PhD who's just starting out, they're going to read over it and they're going to decide, does this article add something new to our field? These are experts in the field, other expert reviewers. They'll either say, yes, this is great. We should publish it. They'll say, well, maybe, but it needs some revisions and it'll go back up to the editor to start again. Or it'll say, yes, this should be published and it'll be rejected. So the reviews then, the editor will look at those reviews and Usually there's two to four people who review each article. They'll decide, do the reviews seem to suggest it should be published or shouldn't it? They'll decide to accept it. It'll go through edits and production, and then it'll be published. Now, this is one of those reasons why the peer-reviewed articles take six months to a year um, to come out. Usually the article you read in a scholarly source was written a year to two years before its publication date. This is a really rigorous publication process. It means that only the most important, um, influential, and kind of exigent, relevant, and current information is getting out there. And it also, um, because it's a blind review process, 
peer review is published only when the actual writing has merit. So if you are the most famous historian of your age, it doesn't matter because when your article goes to get peer reviewed, nobody knows who wrote it. This is one of the reasons why peer reviewed articles are kind of the gold standard for research. So I hope this short um, introduction to sources has helped you kind of understand the various types of sources you'd run into. Um, feel free to go back and review the information in this, look over some of the diagrams and charts I've posted. And if you have any other questions, let me know.